morning, everyone. It's good to see so many people here. I thought we were going to be empty with the bike ride going on and all, so it's a, it's a pleasure to see everybody. So we've been working through the book of Nahum. We finished chapter two last week, and I didn't want to jump into chapter three this week because we've got so many people uh, who aren't going to, uh, who weren't going to be here. But we started talking about something last week that I thought was worth looking into a little bit more. We can cover that today. And it works good for visitors too because it's kind of a standalone message as well. So we were working through in Nahum chapter two, it was a prophecy going into depth about the destruction of Nineveh that was going to happen because of their great wickedness. And so there was all this prophecy about that. And we worked through this and we worked through how God's wrath is an extension of his love. And also, it's just always interesting to see the Bible predict something to happen. And then we see in history that it actually came true exactly as the Bible predicted that. And we talked about that concept last week. And we said this is really a big builder of faith when the Bible can predict the future because uh, only God can do something like that. And then we also explored the idea that, well, the time that the prophecy was written was when God revealed his plans to man. But God had made these plans long, long before he revealed them. And we worked through some passage of Ephesians, actually, that's in our bulletin today, same one as last week. But that proved out that God had actually, since before the beginning of time, before he created the world, he had created all of these plans. And the implication was big. And that is simply that God is all powerful and he's all knowing and he has orchestrated all of these things that are happening around us for his reasons since before time itself began. So that's how we can have faith in what he tells us and in his word and we can trust him because clearly he has everything under control. It has already been figured out since before time itself uh, even began. That is tremendous. Um, but we've got the world around us today is hostile to God. It's hostile to the Bible. And there's a tremendous attack on all things biblical. But this idea of God creating his plans before he created the world, I think, has been under attack because the world for a while now has said, well, God didn't actually create the world. It just sort of evolved on its own. And so today I wanted to look at that. What does the Bible say about the creation. If God made these plans before he created everything, what does it really say about the creation? How specific is that? And we'll start out here, just sort of table stakes. We'll look at our church's constitution document. What do, what do we as a church, what is our position on that? And we say, in, we believe in one eternal God existing in three equally divine persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, who created the universe in six literal days for his glory according to his will. That's pretty straightforward. And then we reference some scripture as to where we get this belief from. So let's talk about this a little bit. We'll start out right in the beginning of the very book, Genesis chapter one, the very first sentence starts to address this whole point. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Very straightforward. We skip to verses 26 and 27. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. Now we read these sentences here right at the beginning of the Bible and we see this is a pretty simple concept. It says God created the celestial bodies, God created the earth, God created everything in the earth. This is very straightforward. All life on this earth was initially created by God, the Bible says. All this stuff around us too, the raw materials that we build things with, this too was created by God. And we read about it right at the beginning of the Bible. And there's actually, if you think about it, very few concepts in the Bible that are simpler than this. This is about as straightforward as you get. We don't have to decode any metaphors to come up with what the Bible is trying to tell us. We don't have to triangulate various passages of scriptures across the Old Testament and the New. The Bible is just very clear on this. And if unless you're already trying to read something else into these words, I don't think 
we can come up with another explanation. It just tells us right here in the beginning of the book, it says, you know life and everything around you. Well, that was created by God. And that's really all there is to it from a biblical perspective. But we have to address the elephant in the room here because we are all familiar with the theory of evolution. And that makes claims counter to Genesis chapter one. I mean, evolution and Genesis one, those contradict each other. And so the whole point of evolution is that all this stuff all around us, all life here, everything all around us just sort of happened randomly and on its own apart from any divine intervention at all. And so we have this theory we know this is a very widely accepted theory. This is the only theory that's taught in our schools. This is the only belief that uh, we're allowed to publicly subscribe to and still be taken seriously in the public sphere. We've talked about this sort of thing before when we addressed gender and marriage and these sorts of things. And I stated then, and I'll state it again, I honestly believe that all of these hot button issues of the day, gender, sexuality, marriage, evolution, these um, are only issues, I think, because they're an attack on Christianity. It's an attack on the Bible. These are very good attacks. Um, evolution, creation, I think it's the same type of attack, same type of assault that we're seeing in so many other ways in our society right now, except I think in a lot of ways, too, it's really better or more effective than some of the other ones. And the brilliance of it is, if you can teach children from very young age that the first sentence in the Bible is wrong, you don't have to teach them to disregard the rest of the book. You don't, right? People just throw it right out, right? Who's gonna listen to our very reasonable and loving explanation as to why we feel marriage should be kept as something between a man and a woman when we're already labeled or thought of as a bunch of backwards, ignorant, moronic people uh, who believe every scientist on earth is wrong and in the face of overwhelming evidence of evolution, we just insist that our magical being that we can't even see created everything anyway. That's how the world views us. So who would listen to somebody who subscribes to that sort of thing? That's it, that's the attack. And it works apparently, it's been very effective. But here's the irony, despite what everybody has been taught, despite what everybody thinks that they know, evolution is not settled science. Evolution, has never been proven. In fact, there's not a single shred of evidence that has ever been found that supports macroevolution. That is one kind of animal um, that described in Genesis becoming another kind of animal. It's never ever been found at all. There's not a single ob observation out there that even suggests this. It's just not there. It's mathematically impossible. It's scientifically impossible. And the struggle I get whenever we get onto this topic, I know for like, some of you guys are really into this, and uh, the struggle is we could talk all morning about mathematically and scientifically what the problems are with this evolution and, and the stuff they never teach in schools, and it really doesn't work, but we're not here to dismantle that. We're here to talk about the Word of God. And so if we just look at just what does the Word of God say about creation, not why evolution is unacceptable, um, that's what we're going to focus on this morning. There's a whole lot of other good resources out there if you want to uh, explore the issues with what is being uh, taught and held up in society around us. Uh, if you're curious about that, uh, we can talk after. We can point you in some directions with that. But if we go back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, the very first sentence of the Bible, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Um, it just says, very clear as day, God made the universe and everything in it. If we put the pieces together in the Bible, you can trace it back and we see we've got this 6,000 years of history since this event biblically took place and empires have risen and fallen, things have been built, technologies have been discovered and, and worked on and uh, topography changes and all sorts of things uh, happen. A lot has happened over the past 6,000 years, but prior to that, there was literally nothing in existence but God forever. And I don't even know if there was a thing that we call time or how we observe time. I don't know if that was even around before, but there was just simply God. And so we could refer to that time before the creation is just the before, and it's always been there eternally. And it's a really hard thing to wrap our minds around. I don't know if we're capable of fully understanding that. But the Bible mentions this time in Psalm 90, verse 2. It says, before the mountains were born or you brought forth the whole world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. 
Jesus spoke about this time as well. He talked about uh, being with the Father before time, before the world began. John 17, 5, And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. You skip to verse 24, same chapter in John. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. And so the state of affairs before the creation is actually described here in the Bible. And it's not a situation where God was just in this static state and nothing happened or nothing really existed and God was just sitting there. It's very clear from what we just read before the creation took place, there was glory. Before the creation took place, there was love. God was these things before he created. God the Father showed love to his son during this time. And the Bible says that he also showed love to us during this time as well. And this is the mind-blowing concept we started grappling with last week. Again, go back to our bulletin verse for, uh, for this week and last week, Ephesians 1, 4 through 6. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. If you think about that, it's absolutely astonishing. And normally this verse comes up when we start working through that whole, well, how much of me following God is my idea versus just God's idea? And it's a wonderful verse to go to for working through that. But if we think about what else this is saying and what we talked about last week and, and what we're talking about this morning, there's a lot more to it than that. The world around us likes to talk about love, but the love that the world talks about, it's not this agape selfless love that the Bible says God actually is. Love from a worldly perspective, love from a perspective outside of the Bible is all just based on feelings. We know feelings are very powerful things. They fill us with emotion. They fill us with passion. But remember where James says that place of innermost feelings where that comes from inside of man. James says that's not from God. That's actually demonic. But this is all the type of love that the world knows. That's all the world knows. And so people don't have a relationship with God, they become enamored and they become motivated by these feelings of love or what they think is love. And people say they fall in love. And when their feelings and their emotions move on to something else, they say, well, I've fallen out of love too. And so when, so I think what you're left with then is just this type of love. If that's all you know. You're just left with this type of love. That's a very hot, fast burning thing. And it can make you feel on top of the world. But the next day, it can turn you upside down and make you do some crazy things. Whether your experience with that turns out to be a, a nice ride for the whole rest of your life or some kind of Shakespearean tragedy, at the end of the day, worldly love is always, always transitory. It always has a beginning and it always has an end. And when you think about its existence in the context of the universe, right, you have this eternity of the before time, God existing for an eternity forever, and then God creates everything, the Bible says, and that goes on for 6,000 years, and it's going to go on for some other uh, unknown to us amount of time, and then we'll have the 1,000-year millennial kingdom, and then an eternity after that of the new heaven and the new earth. And so when we think about that just tremendous timeline that the Bible lays out, this unbroken story of him and of us, and then we consider layering on top of that this very strong, passionate, worldly love that people let guide them, we can realize just how irrelevant our feelings truly are. Whether our feelings of worldly love last for 20 years or 20 days, in comparison to that giant timeline that God has laid out, it really amounts to nothing. But not God's love. God's love is eternal just read it says he loved us since before he created the earth before time itself he loved us and he's going to continue to do that forever and he's going to do that eternally with that agape love that selfless type of action word love not a warm feeling but putting someone else's needs above their own that's the type of love that you work on the type of love that you do rather than feel god has had that love for you since before he created all of this 
So we have this eternity past, this before time, this really interesting period of time before God created anything. And I know I've had some long conversations with more than one of you about what that looked like. It's fascinating to think about. But there was this time, the Bible says, where God was glorified, the Father showed love to the Son, and He showed love to us as well. But then there obviously had to be this point that there was a transition from the before time to this time that we have now. God's creation is literal when we read the Word of God. It's, that's how it is presented. It is a literal event. Again, Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And it's not just in the first sentence of the Bible. It's all throughout the whole book. There's references um, through all of this. There was a beginning. Matthew 19. Four says, haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning, the creator made them male and female. Hebrews 1.10, in the beginning, Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands. Second Peter chapter three, verse four, ever since your ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. There's more and more verses like this spread throughout the whole Bible. The Bible also refers to this as a foundation. Job 38, 4, God says, Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? And there's many more foundation references as well. And so the point I'm trying to make here is that the story of creation is not some fairy tale that just shows up at the beginning of Genesis and that we can disregard Right? Evidence of the creation is found all throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. And because of that, accepting God's account of creation really winds up as being non-negotiable, in my opinion. We don't have this line item veto where we can cross out parts of the Bible that we want and sort of add things in with pencil that we want as well. I wish I did. I really wish I had that authority, but I don't. We can't take things out. We can't add things. Thomas Jefferson did this. He published his own Bible and he made some changes. He actually took the resurrection out of the Bible because, you know, why not? Um, but even the great Thomas Jefferson wasn't authorized to do that. We're not authorized to do that either. The Bible refers to a literal account of creation all throughout its text. That's how it's presented. There was a pre-existing eternal God. And then at some point, this beginning, God created the Bible gives us some picture of how this creation happens, and we can see all the persons of God were involved. God the Father is the source, God the Son is the channel, and God the Holy Spirit is the active agent in creation. And we can see creation taking place, um, leveraging this structure. 1 Corinthians 8, 6 shows God the Father as the source. There is but one God, the Father, from whom all things came, and for whom we live. This verse goes on to show the Son as the channel. It continues, And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came, and through whom we live. And in Job 33, 4, Elihu describes the Holy Spirit as the active agent. He says, The Spirit of the Lord has made me. So the Bible is very clear on this. In this beginning, everything was created by God. There is no room at all in our theology for an evolutionary process. Nothing is said to have started as one thing and turned into another. I mean, you have God creating woman out of man, but they're the same kind, they're the same species. And God makes his creation entirely without any pre-existing materials. And he does this in six literal days. This is what the text says. Now, here's where a lot of well-meaning Christians go off the rails, in my opinion. We've seen this in other points of doctrine where people try to take Christianity and the popular thoughts of the day and try to meld them together. And I get the appeal of trying to do that. But when that happens, and especially with regards to this, a lot of people get tripped up uh, by a verse in 2 Peter with regards to trying to do this with evolution. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8 says, With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. And so sometimes people will see this verse, and then they try to go back to the creation account in Genesis, and they'll say something like, well, when it talks about these six days of creation, it's not literal days of creation, right? Because Peter says a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. So it's these long periods of time that are being described and metaphorically called days. They say it's referencing larger blocks of time. And when you do that, 
then you can still accommodate this worldly view of an old earth, right? And we can still reconcile that to our Bibles. And by the way, if we've got this old earth now that we can accommodate biblically, then maybe evolution really did happen, but it was just a process that was either started by God or maybe even facilitated by him. And on the surface, this sounds really nice, right? Because we can hold on to our Bibles and say, yep, this is absolutely just fine, and we don't have to worry about what the world says. There's no contradiction at all. It allows us to accept this newfangled theory of evolution and still be able to explain to our friends why the Bible is still relevant. And the icing on the cake is we're able to use the Bible to do that. We can point to 2 Peter and say, oh, well, this is how, this is sort of the key to how all of these things fit together. But the problem is, this is not what Peter was talking about when we read the words in Genesis. Genesis talks about seven literal 24-hour days. Right? That is just very clear from the reading this text. Firstly, from a grammatical perspective, you can't interpret the Hebrew in Genesis chapter 1 as talking about anything but single actual days. In Hebrew, the word for day is yom, and on its own, you can monkey around with the meaning of yom all you want to. On its own, if you just use that word, you can second Peter that word all you want to. Yom can be a, a day or yom can be a thousand years. That is all well and good. But here, in the accounts of creation, in its biblical context, the word yom is preceded by a numerical adjective. The first day, the second day. And in Hebrew, the way this is structured grammatically, this would be understood by native speakers as a time reference to literal days. Second, the words preceding our numerical adjectives also show this. It says there was evening and there was morning the first day. This is describing how your Hebrew calendar works. For us, we wake up in the morning and the day ends at night and we go to sleep. But to the Jewish mind, they look at the calendar differently. Your day starts in the evening and then you go to sleep, you wake up, you go about your day and it finishes uh, at the end of the afternoon. So it's presented here, there was evening and there was morning, the first day. It's grammatically presented as a literal 24-hour day. And when we see this same, we see a day described this same way in Scripture and other places, morning or evening and morning, um, first day or second day or whatever, it's always talking about a literal 24-hour day. Daniel 8.14 uses that same construction. It gives us a prophecy of 2,300 evenings and mornings, and we see the prophecy gets fulfilled literally in a period of just over six years. Third, if we remember the week of creation was also used as a template for man's work week in the establishment of the Sabbath. Exodus chapter 20, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of, your Lord, of the Lord your God. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. So this makes sense only if the Genesis account of creation is a literal six-day affair. If those are metaphorical days, your whole Sabbath day discussion in Exodus 20 doesn't make any sense. Fourth, Genesis 1.14 talks about how on the fourth day, God says, uh, let there be lights in the vault of the sky to separate the day from the night and let them serve as signs to mark the sacred times and days and years. And it goes on to talk about days and nights. And so linguistically, it makes no sense to mix this metaphorical yom that's some period of time with literal yom, day and night, uh, literal version of yom in the same sentence that just doesn't work at all. Um, so I think the only reason you would read this and come up with an alternative than the Bible's talking about literal days as if you're trying to read consciously or subconsciously something else into the text that the Bible never intended to say. And there's more stuff we can talk about here. I could talk all morning about this, but I think it's pretty clear. The Bible is clear that it's talking about a six-day creation event. In the end, we see the Bible absolutely presents a literal account of creation it occurs in six 24-hour long days. This happened about 6,000 years ago. And if we believe the rest of the Bible, we should believe this too. <clears throat> Don't get confused by the world around us. Believing in biblical creation does not make you ignorant or backwards or any negative thing at all. It just makes you a faithful believer in God's word. And what's so crazy about that, really? What's harder to believe? 
a very simple explanation of how all of this came to be that works and matches with what you see around us, or a very complicated, very convoluted theory that when you look at it mathematically and you look at the evidence that's been found doesn't actually add up, which takes more faith to actually believe in. We can see evidence of God in our lives. We can see evidence of God all around us. Why would we not take him at his word when he said he created everything? Again, evolution, not a settled science. It's just a theory. And it's a theory predicated on absolutely no evidence whatsoever. The fossil record actually supports creation. Scientists can't explain how evolution got started outside of offering more unproven and unsupported theories. The only thing evolutionists are sure of is the presupposition that there is no God. My friends, that is what this whole struggle is all about. Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. If evolution turns this first sentence of the Bible into a myth, then the whole rest of the Bible also becomes a myth. Ephesians 1, 4 to 6, For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. If evolution has turned creation into a myth, then it's also turned God's love for us into a myth. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one his one, son, one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. If evolution has turned God's love into a myth, then it turns Jesus into a myth too. My friends, this is why we really have this battle in our schools and our, this battle in the public, public sphere. It's not a quest for scientific truth. Right? If this was really a quest for scientific truth, then we should be able to sit down and have evolution and creation taught side by side we should encourage the children in schools and people in our universities to debate the merits of both and really look at the evidence that suggests both sides of it, right? If it really was just a, a, a quest for scientific truth, then we should be able to have these discussions without any problem at all, right? But debates aren't encouraged here. Silence is encouraged because our enemy knows that the truth of God is self-evident and nothing can stand against that. And so our adversary tries to wipe away the truth and for a time, like the wickedness of Nineveh, he'll be successful. Right? Like Nineveh, he's pretty, been pretty successful at taking over the world through butchery and savagery. But like Nineveh, our adversary is going to fall too. It's prophesied in the book. Eventually, God's suffering is going to run out. God's justice and wrath is going to be poured out. And the end of the Bible is going to be proven to be just as true as the very first sentence in Genesis chapter 1. Do you bow with me in prayer? Dear Heavenly Lord, we thank you so much for letting us be here this morning. I thank you for giving us your word. And I just pray, Lord, that you would give us wisdom from the things we have talked about this morning. And if I have made any mistakes in what I have said, I pray you would bring those things to light. We could discard those things and not be led astray. But Lord, anything we've talked about that is true and in accordance with your word, please help us to understand uh, what you want us to learn from this. Give us wisdom from these things that we can become better sons and daughters to you as a result. And Lord, thank you for showing us the truth. Thank you for making the truth so plain and simple in the words of the book that you have given us. And as we live in a world that tries to obfuscate the truth and tries to get rid of what's in this book, Lord, we thank you for maintaining this and giving us this truth that we can hold on to until you come back for us. We love you dearly. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you all stand with us one last time for hymn 290, The Love of God.